The New York Islanders got some good news about Matthew Barzal, but then had a weekend of discontent as they lost to both the Lightning and the Hurricanes. We're going to break down both games and explain when Barzy may be back. We've got all that and more on today's Locked On Islanders podcast. Your Locked On Islanders, your daily podcast on the New York Islanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome, everybody, to the Monday edition of the Locked On Islanders podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks for making Locked On Islanders your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. Disappointing weekend for the New York Islanders. We'll break it all down for you. But first, if there's something Islanders related on your mind, if you have a question for us, a a comment about something we discussed on the show, or maybe a topic you'd like us to talk about on a future episode, feel free to send us an email, the email address lockedonislanders at gmail.com. And if you leave your first name and where you're from, we're happy to mention you on the show when we discuss whatever it is that's on your mind. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Isles. And you could follow me, Gil Martin, on Twitter at Ice Wars, N-Y-R-V-S-N-Y-I. We'll keep you up to date on all the latest Islanders news, notes, and happenings. And I am also live tweeting during every Islanders home and road game. So join me for some instant insight and analysis. And it's always great to talk a little Isles hockey with fellow Isles fans, game time or any time. So do feel free to reach out and uh, we'll, we'll talk a little Isles hockey. All right. Tough weekend. For the New York Islanders, two games, two losses, and I guess the big issue for me was not that they lost both games, it's how they lost both games. They were thoroughly outplayed in both games, did not look hungry, did not look sharp, did not look ready to play, and as a result, we knew going into this weekend that it would be a tough, tough, battle you're playing you know a team that has been to the stanley cup final three straight years and won two of the last three stanley cups in the tampa bay lightning and then a team that is in first place in your division both games on the road it was a tall order to expect the islanders to win both games i was hoping they would find a way to get two points on the weekend it would have been huge if they did but they came away empty and I I have to say again the way they played was even more disappointing than the actual outcome and let's start with the the Saturday game against Tampa Bay and believe it or not even though they lost five nothing on Saturday and only two to one on Sunday the Islanders actually played a little bit better on Saturday against the Lightning than they did against Carolina. And, you know, the Islanders had 38 shots on goal uh, in this game to 32 for Tampa Bay. So, you know, even that aspect of it, the Islanders were a little bit better at creating some chances, but there was no way they were going to beat Andre Vasilevsky, who was playing at the top of his game. And, The other problem, if you're an Islanders fan, is that so many mistakes, you know, the Islanders defensively had a lot of little breakdowns and little mistakes, and yet when that happened, it always seemed to end up in the back of the net. And, you know, Ilya Sorokin gave up four goals in that game in a little bit more than half the game, almost 32 minutes. He didn't play badly. I think three out of the four goals, you can't blame him. But those defensive breakdowns, the inability to win 50-50 puck battles, the inability to to pass the puck or skate the puck out of your zone and transition to offense, and then just those turnovers that just seemed to come at the wrong time. And any time the turnovers came, 
there was a blown assignment in the Islander zone, and voila, the puck is in the back of the net. So a very disappointing performance, but overall, uh, still looking for this Islanders team to just give more effort, and they just couldn't seem to do that. And look, you know, there's plenty of blame to go around to me. You know, Anders Lee and Ryan Pulak, both minus three in this game. That certainly didn't bode well for the way they were playing defense. But, you know, at least they got some scoring chances in this game. Ryan Pulak had five shots on goal and Adam Pellick had five shots on goal. That tied for the team lead among forwards. Who else? Pierre Engvall and Kyle Palmieri. And, you know, that was the offensive line, again, that did the most damage. Brock Nelson only had one shot on goal. But that line of Nelson, Palmieri, and Engvall, those guys were all even in a game where your team got shut, uh, blanked five to nothing. And four of those goals came at even strength. So, you know, that line seems to be the only one on the team right now that is actually gelling and, and contributing consistently to the offensive production. And again, we see just an, a, a lack of ability to sustain uh, the attack when they were in the offensive zone, you know, they had, I would say, seven or eight quality chances. Too many of the chances, though, from behind the faceoff dots back to the to the uh, blue line where they were long distance shots and they weren't getting those rebounds and deflections. And Vasilevsky, I could tell you right now when he's on his game and oh boy, was he on his game on Saturday? If he sees the puck, he's going to stop the puck. And you know what? That's exactly what he did, and he did it well. Uh, Cal Clutterbuck, seven hits in the game. Casey Sezikis, six hits in the game. Matt Martin, four. So the identity line doing its thing. And yeah, but they they still you know, weren't generating a lot offensively, although that's not their role. But, you know, Bo Horvat, again, one shot on goal. Uh, you need more from your Horvats and your Lees and your Nelsons. And, you know, Nelson, one shot on goal. Horvat, one shot on goal. Lee uh, had two. Those are your three most dangerous offensive players uh, other than that one line of, uh, you know, with Nelson, Engvall, and uh, Palmieri, but, you know, these guys just aren't putting pucks on net, and it didn't work. Hudson Fashing, one shot on goal. Simon Holmstrom, one shot on goal. I like Fashing a lot. Anyone who's been watching and listening to this podcast knows how high I am on Hudson Fashing, but first line, no, that's not his role, and he showed he really isn't ready uh, to be a first line player. And yet the Islanders, you know, kept him on that first line, not just Saturday, but again on Sunday. So disappointing performance Saturday. There were, you know, a few bright spots, but too many defensive breakdowns. And that ended up hurting the Islanders. When we come back, we'll talk about Sunday's game, a disappointing two to one loss to the Carolina Hurricanes, who may be the Islanders' first-round playoff opponent if the Islanders actually make the playoffs. We have to see, and we'll talk about the race and how it's tightening up, plus the latest on Matthew Barzal and a few more injury updates. All that and more still to come on this episode of the Locked On Islanders podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by your friends at eBay Motors for a championship team. It's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. And it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors with eBay Guaranteed Fit. You can be sure that every part fits 
right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or you get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Sunday's game, quite honestly, Islander fans, was worse than Saturday's. Yeah, it was only a one-goal loss compared to a five-goal loss, but I think the team played worse. Outshot in this one, 35-22, to 22, and, you know, the shots on goal, again, for the Islanders, this was sort of the big breakdown uh, in my mind. And it was that the Islanders had maybe four high danger chances in this game. Uh, they officially, according to natural stat trick, four high danger chances at five on five and five total for the game. Carolina, 16 for the game, 13 five on five. When you are, when the other team has more than three times as many high danger chances and you only lose by one goal, First of all, it tells me that your goaltender, in this case, again, Ilya Sorokin, uh, played exceptionally well. And I think that Lane Lambert was actually wise to take Sorokin out of the game when he fell behind 4 nothing on Saturday and let Varley finish so Sorokin could be sharp and rested for the second game of the back-to-back. And I think that actually worked. But I'm sorry. Uh, I know the... Carolina Hurricanes are a very well-coached team, and they are one of the better defensive teams in the league. But you cannot, and I, I will repeat, you cannot uh, you know, only go through an entire game with six or five high-danger chances. Five high-danger chances not going to get it done. Some lineup changes also. Sebastian Ajo. Back in the lineup, he had sat out the last six games, uh, and he replaced Alexander Romanov. Romanov had suffered an upper body injury, uh, which took place against Tampa Bay, and he is officially day to day. And then Josh Bailey, um, he's been a healthy scratch the last three games, seven of the last eight. He was back in the lineup, Simon Holmstrom sitting you know, Bailey was out there for 13 and a half minutes, played with Parise and Pajot, uh, blocked one shot, had, I love, you know, the way they put it, uh, two shot attempts, but no shots on goal. And it wasn't, uh, he wasn't particularly noticeable. And I guess, you know, when I look at Bailey and Holmstrom, both of them, the, neither one of them are particularly noticeable in too many of the games that they play at this stage in their careers. Uh, Bailey, because he's kind of getting older and is on the downside, and Holmstrom, because he's still learning the ropes in the NHL and hasn't reached his full potential yet. But either way, you know, the old expression, there were too many passengers. These guys tend more often than not to be passengers, and it was disappointing to see. And, you know, again, uh, Hudson Fashing on the top line, not working out. He didn't have a shot on goal. Anders Lee on the top line. He didn't have a shot on goal. Bo Horvat, two shots on goal, but he was uncharacteristically bad in the faceoff circle, winning only four of 13. But again, a lot of defensive breakdowns, a lot of turnovers. Only two of them ended up in the back of the net, although Sorokin making 33 saves and 35 shots faced really was the reason this game wasn't 5-1 or 6-1 because quite honestly, uh, the Islanders were thoroughly, thoroughly outplayed. And yeah, it was a pretty goal. Guess what? Engvall setting up Pajot for the goal that made it 1-0 Islanders after one. It was late in the first period. 
But after that, as soon as the game was tied, first of all, even before the game was tied in the second period, you felt the goal coming. And, you know, some of the fans that I was, you know, going back and forth with on Twitter during the game, uh, they knew too. You could feel it building. You could feel the pressure. You could see the Islanders on their heels, not defending well, not picking up men in their, uh, uh, you know, coming through the neutral zone. And the breakdowns kept happening. And eventually, uh, Jesperi Kotkaniemi ties the game and, and Martinuk wins it in the third early. And the Islanders, even though they were down two to one with 17 and a half minutes left in the game, they had nothing in the tank uh, until it was too late and just did not create scoring chances. And look, I like Bo Horvat. Uh, I, I still think that he will be a solid addition to this team, especially once they get back Matthew Barzal and maybe next year with Oliver Wallstrom or hopefully another offensive weapon who they can add to this roster in time for next season. But right now, they're not getting the play they need from Bo Horvat. And whether it's the fact that he's not comfortable with this system whether it's the fact that he's playing with, you know, your Hudson Fashings and your Simon Holmstrom's at different times. No offense to those guys. They're just not top six talent at this stage in their careers. And one other thing, Brock Nelson, he's playing with the face shield. He doesn't look like himself. And Brock Nelson has been uh, by far the best offensive player this team has last couple of games didn't really show a lot of offense, and that definitely had an effect on the way this team is playing. Anders Lee, you got to do better. Lee and Horvat, you know, again, as I said last week on the show, their styles, I think, are a little too similar for them to be on a line together, and yet there they were on a line together again. I think they need to separate them, but until Barzi comes back, what are we talking about? Who who do you have if you don't want to break up Nelson, Palmieri, and Engvall? You don't have a lot of other choices. You could put Parise up there. They've tried that. Uh, maybe that's a little bit better than, you know, Bailey really hasn't worked. Fashing hasn't worked. Holmstrom hasn't worked. Uh, right now, there's just nobody who seems to sort of fit into – this mold of being that other guy on the top line. Now, as far as our unsung hero and goat of the game from Sunday, unsung hero, I'm going with Pierre Engvall. Engvall with the assist. Uh, he was a plus one in this game, as was Kyle Palmieri. And I, I just think, you know, Engvall continues to do a pretty good job of, uh, of, creating some opportunities for his teammates and playing well. As far as the go to the game, so many to choose from. I'm going with Noah Dobson, who just continues to play sloppy hockey in his own zone. And look, here's, here's another problem that this team has, and it has to do with depth on the blue line. You have Bolduc, Aho, and Dobson out there. Bolduc, Probably, you know, the best of those three defensively, but inexperienced, and they, they still don't have a lot of trust in him. Aho, I like how he moves the puck, but he just, you know, he had a costly giveaway, and he he took a penalty. He drew a penalty, but he took a penalty, and he struggles because of his size in his own zone. And Dobson, boy, has he regressed this year defensively. And that's been a major disappointment when three of your six defensemen are players who are problematic in your own zone and you're a defense first team like the Islanders, that is really going to hurt. And I will say this, unless uh, Alexander Romanov is available for the next game on Thursday and the fact that it's not until Thursday means there's a better chance he'll be ready, but I would sit Sebastian Ajo and put in Parker Wotherspoon just to get 
some better balance on the blue line, or maybe, you know, you can't sit Noah Dobson only because there's nobody else offensively who can provide what they provide, but keep uh, Dobson has to play and Aho has to play with either Pelic or Pula, uh, Polak. It has to be because they are so vulnerable defensively. You need a guy who can cover for them. If Romanov is healthy, maybe he can play with Romanov, but boy, do they need to be better in their own zone and to have three defensemen who you're not fully comfortable with in your own zone is a recipe for disaster, especially if you're playing quality opponents like the Lightning and the Hurricanes, and these are the teams you're going to face in the playoffs. We have got more to get to on today's show. We have the latest on Matthew Barzal's injury situation and Oliver Wallstrom's for that matter, plus uh, our Islanders' birthday of the day, a player who was part of one of the most famous and best moments for the Islanders in the entire decade of the 2000s. All that and more still to come on today's Locked On Islanders podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by AG1 by Athletic Greens. The grip of winter is finally being loosened, and you may be trying to get back to a more healthy and active lifestyle. Well, what better to pair with some new exercise habits than a daily dose of nutritional insurance in the form of AG1? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adoptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, nervous system, immune system, energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all these things, and it's lifestyle-friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, and to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and buy free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. That's athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So Matthew Barzal going to be skating again back on the ice. Probably means he's at least a week away, but it means he's making progress and barring Hopefully, we don't have to deal with any setbacks. But, you know, I would say right now, the New York Islanders, they have four games left on the schedule. If they can get Barzy into one or two of those games at the end of the season, that would be huge for the New York Islanders. Now, here is the problem that this team faces. Uh, Well, let's also get to the other announcement that the Islanders made, uh, Oliver Wallstrom out for the year. Now, we kind of knew that already, but uh, Barzal coming back, Wallstrom done for the year. That's not just the regular season, but the playoffs. The Islanders are hoping that he will be back. Uh, And the thing about Barzal, number one, you need him to get Bo Horvat. To uh, back on that line and and get Horvat going, he has been really slumping since Barzi went down, and hopefully his return energizes and improves Horvat's play. And then the power play, they in the last seventeen games just twelve and a half percent, and you know the they didn't even do anything over the weekend on the power play. They are next to last in the league during that time period. And it is not getting better. They're not even creating chances. They are still giving up better chances to the shorthanded team than they are to the team, you know, than they are on the power play. This team, 30th overall in the league on the power play out of 32 teams, not going to get the job done. And as we've said, in the playoffs, you need the power play. Hopefully, they can get it back. As for Wallstrom, hopefully, he's back for training camp and they are ready to rock and roll next season. Time now for our Islanders' birthday of the day. And uh, today is the 48th birthday of former Islanders forward Sean Bates. Bates, 
a native of Melrose, Massachusetts, drafted by his hometown Boston Bruins in the fourth round back in 1993, spent four productive years at Boston University and debuted in the NHL with the Bruins in 97-98, became an Islander during the 2001-2002 season and stayed with the Isles through the 07-08 campaign for his career 465 games, 72 goals, 198 points in 266 penalty minutes. Really a, more of a, of a two-way forward, a, a checking forward who could also give you 15 or so goals. But for anyone who remembers Sean Bates as a player, the magic moment in his career, game four of the 2002 Eastern Conference opening round playoff, against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Islanders down in the series two games to one. This one at the Nassau Coliseum. The game tied by the Maple Leafs with three and a half minutes left in regulation time. And Sean Bates gets a penalty shot. He skates in and makes a great move to beat Curtis Joseph. And the Islanders end up winning the game four to three. It evened the series at two and two. It went seven games. The home team won all seven. And unfortunately, the Islanders lost game seven, four to two. But that penalty shot was such an emotional moment. It came less than a minute after Shane Corson tied the game. It was a physical game. And Sean Bates put the puck home and that is one of the more memorable moments for the Islanders in the entire decade of the 2000s. So again, uh, a very happy 48th birthday to Sean Bates. He is our Islanders birthday of the day. That is going to do it for this episode of the Locked on Islanders podcast. I want to thank you for making Locked on Islanders your first listen today. Now make your second listen game to game NHL. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every contest from across the National Hockey League with no local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NHL, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back tomorrow with another great show. We'll break down some more of the things the Islanders need to do to get back on track because the playoff race is really heating up. And there's no margin for error with just four games left on the schedule. We'll talk about that and a lot more. So join us for that. Have a great day, everybody. Stay safe. And of course, let's go Islanders.